welcome to Adelaide. My name's Jared from As Good As Gold Australia and today I'm standing out here by the beautiful River Torrens in Adelaide. Just before you watch this interview, I'm here to share with you an exciting event that we have coming up in Adelaide and Melbourne in October this year. Australia's coming Economic Armageddon brings together the As Good As Gold Australia team and former economic advisor to the Australian Coalition Party and now Chief Economist for As Good As Gold Australia, Mr John Adams. On Saturday the 6th of October at the Highway Hotel, Adelaide will host what will be the most important and significant economic event in the state this year. Make no mistake that Australia and the world are heading into uncharted waters, experiencing unsurpassed levels of debt and long-term low interest rates. It remains most concerning that Australians and policymakers are still very unprepared for such an extreme economic event. John will share his insight with you as to how this economic Armageddon event may play out and steps that you can take to protect yourself and not only survive but thrive in these uncertain times. So register now. Tickets are available at the registration link below this video. Adelaide will be on the 6th of October and Melbourne to come will let you know when that date is very soon. Keep in mind this is one economic event you're not going to want to miss. See you there and enjoy the interview. Hi everyone, my name's Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia, and today I'm joined by my brother Brian and partner at As Good As Gold. And today, once again, we have a very special guest. Today we interviewed John Adams, former economic advisor to the Australian Coalition Party and now chief economist at As Good As Gold Australia. Welcome, John Adams. How are you going today? Oh, good, John. John, as a starter today, why don't we have a look at the Australian economy, um, in particular the housing space. We appear to be heading headlong into some very challenging times, not unlike what the US experienced in 2007, 2008, leading up to the GFC. Very simply, the banks in Australia have provided easy money with very casual lending criteria. Minimal deposits and low interest rates have been the catalyst to provide massive incentive to investors to enter the property market. Rapidly rising property values have led to investors utilizing their newfound equity in their existing property or properties to invest in another. This has led to a property bubble that now appears to be extremely vulnerable. We are now looking at interest rate increases, the end of interest only mortgages, with the banks now favoring principal and interest loans. They have also massively stiffened up on their lending criteria. This combination, of course, will lead to less buyers, forcing the price of properties down. I note that Martin North has made a reference just recently on 60 Minutes to a potential 40 to 45% drop in property values over the next three to four years. John, this scenario does not look all that dissimilar to the 2007, 2008 GFC. How do you think this may play out? Well, um, so, so the first thing uh, for, that I would like to say on this is, is that in terms of what we're seeing at the moment, we're seeing a mild um, fall in house prices um, and all the factors that you alleviated to uh, in terms of uh, the uh, tightening up of lending standards the exposure of credit, uh, credit fraud uh, through the Royal Commission. And, and obviously we're seeing uh, the big four raise interest rates because global interest rates are going up. Uh, these are having a factor on house prices. And, and the Prime Minister made some comments in the news yesterday about trying to engineer a soft landing because he said he and, and the, the banks and the rating agencies were concerned about uh, house prices getting under control. But, but for me, that is not the main game. The main game is household debt, uh, and household debt is at a record high in this country, and it continues to go up. So we saw with the statistics that were released by the government that in the June quarter, household debt uh, increased at a slower rate compared to m the March quarter, but household debt is still going up. Uh, and, and, and when I've uh, written uh, for As Good As Gold, but all, also but when I've written for News Limited previously, I've talked about structural imbalances and the big imbalance is, 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 is the debt and the debt continues to go up. I was, just, I was just recently, I read an article, John. This is going back a couple of months ago. This is the same paper. This is the advertiser, a Saturday edition. And it's probably glistening a little bit there, but the, the rise and rise of real estate is the heading and the best 
is yet to come. Okay, so I look, I read the same paper going back just a few, a couple of weeks, under two weeks ago, it was 10 days ago, Get Your House in Order, David Koch. And David suggests in this particular article that for those who have entered into mortgage commitments with a very low deposit, looking at what's ahead with the, the, the high risk of property value starting to fall, it's quite possible that these, in, these investors may very well not have any equity in their property. For example, if they put five or a 10% deposit down and property values drop 20%, they have no equity. The banks will not tolerate that. So this is just around the corner. In fact, David suggests that if you're in this position, probably best to sell now. Get out before, while you can. Um, your thoughts? So, so, so obviously, the you know the, the first interesting observation is is you know you've you've put out two completely different narratives from from the same publication, and I think there's a lot of propaganda and a lot of misinformation that that has been pushed by various media outlets around the property sector, but also about how strong the economy really is, and that's given a whole host of Australians a false sense of security about where the economy is headed, what the real risk position is, uh, and, and a whole host of people have made decisions based on what they think is relative strength, and yet the economy has been fundamentally unsound for quite a while. So I think the first observation to make is, is that a lot of people are going to be caught out because they, you know, they swallowed the um, sort of propaganda hook, line and sinker. And I think when the chickens come home to roost for a lot of people, confidence in the political system in the banks but also in the media is going to i mean i mean uh, confidence at the moment is pretty low and i think confidence is going to take a, a, a very huge hit in in the months and years uh, going forward so in terms of um what should individual property investors do so obviously if everyone rushes to sell it's going to further push prices down so i don't think you're going to see um you know everyone rushing to the doors yet um, you know, where I think that is likely to happen. And obviously, when you look at what Martin North said about uh, house prices falling to, uh, between 40 to 45% over the next three years, uh, I mean, he was referring to a similar situation in terms of what happened to Ireland. So, so I think, uh, you know, when you look at the, that, given that Australia has the biggest debt bubble in the history of the country, at the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. It's likely, given what happened in the Great Depression, but also in the Depression of 1892 in Australia, we're going to see some sort of significant international event, um, um, you know, um, playing through. Uh, and that's obviously going to result in us being swept through whatever happens through the global financial market. So I think, uh, so I think you know, people could sell at the moment. You've got to see um, further uh, potential uh, reductions in price. Um, I think they'll be quite minimal. And even with... Starting next year, you're going to see a big chunk of people going from uh, interest only to principal and interest. Um, from the evidence I've seen to date, I don't think those factors are going to lead to any systemic crisis in the economy. I think certain people will be in trouble, uh, but I think the economy can handle those headwinds reasonably well. But uh, it will be the international factors that are likely to um, really um, uh, cause a major sort of catastrophe in the economy with millions of Australians international um the international effect what what are you really referring to there can you just expand on that a little bit sure, sure. so so obviously we ha we have uh the biggest uh debt bubble in the history of the world so global debt is about 247 trillion uh, uh or, or about i think uh, about 300 300 percent of GDP, global gdp in excess so so basically you've got uh, economies right across the world that have problems with debt. Uh, and, and depending on which country you go to, the debt is concentrated in different parts of, of, the, of, of their relative economies. So obviously in China, the debt bubble is in the financial sector. In the US, it's, it's largely the corporate sector. Uh, you look at uh, Japan or in, say, Italy, it is in the government sector. Uh, Turkey, or, you know, for example, you know, I mean, they are in the uh, corporate sector. But obviously, you look at Australia and Canada in particular, it's the household sector. So, so, so basically, um, as the, so, because, because what we're seeing at the moment is we're seeing an outbreak of inflation. Uh, you know, you're seeing uh, the highest rate of inflation 
in Canada and the US, the highest in six years. You're seeing um, inflation picking up. Uh, inflation numbers came out this morning uh, in terms of the UK, 2.7%, which was above expectations uh, for analysts in London. Uh, and then you're also seeing uh, across the Eurozone, uh, you know, the ECB inflation target is, um, uh, it, 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 sorry, it is below 2%. Oh, so, so it's just not, so it's just below 2%. And basically uh, you're seeing that the actual Eurozone uh, inflation is, uh, is about 2%. You're seeing um, Germany, Spain, Cyprus, Romania, uh, you know, they're, they're way above uh, the, what the sort of average for the Eurozone is. Uh, and then obviously seeing sort of Hungary and Singapore in the developed world as well, having higher rates of inflation. And then obviously you're seeing, you know, what's really falling apart in the global economy at the moment and in the international monetary system is what ha is happening in emerging markets, which uh, is obviously getting a lot of uh, media attention at the moment. So, you know, you look at, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, Turkey, South Africa, Pakistan, um, Indonesia, um, all of these countries have way too much debt um, there is uh, obviously inflation happening in a number of these countries and confidence has collapsed uh, in the international markets that a number of these countries can meet their international debt obligations. And this is why you're seeing massive falls in their currencies. Uh, and, and because you're seeing the uh, fall in their currencies, you're seeing domestic rates of inflation, uh, you know, go to, uh, you know, in the case of Turkey, a 15 year high. Um, and obviously from that, uh, certain policymakers in these countries have a big choice to make. So in Venezuela, I mean, interest rates are only about 20%. And because they didn't uh, try to uh, handle the sort of uh, inflation problem that they have, this is why they've got hyperinflation. Whereas you look at Argentina, Argentina made the choice of, no, we're going to get inflation under control. So inflation um, in Argentina is about 32%. And they said, well, we're, not, we're going to stop it. From getting from getting from getting out of control, so they've had to raise interest rates to 60%. And obviously, if you looked at that last week, uh, Turkey raised interest rates by five and four percent in one day. Um, uh, and obviously, that was a conscious choice by the Turkish central bank to get the inflation under control. So, 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 so you're starting to see uh, the global debt problem um, fracturing. Um, and, and 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 what's it going to take is someone, some big fish or some government to say we are done, we're insolvent, we can't make these repayments. And then the counterparty will take the loss and then you're going to see some sort of meltdown in the financial markets. Yeah, it's interesting, John. One of the countries, you've mentioned a number of countries there and the condition of their economies. One that I don't or haven't heard a lot about and they don't seem to concentrate on a great deal is Japan. Um, interestingly, I was speaking with a, a client the other day and she has a very successful business in Japan, she teaches English and has a number of schools where she facilitates that. But we were having a really good chat and I, she, she just started to talk about where she lived. And she said, look, I, I live in a property, I'm on the beach. And she talked about the property and said, this is a, it's a five bedroom home. I started probing, asking questions. She said, this is a five bedroom property. It has two really good lounges. It's a two story property. Um, three bathrooms, and we are on the beach. And I thought, said, well, that sounds pretty spectacular. Um, do you mind me asking what you may, when did you buy it, and what sort of value would you place on a property like that? She said, well, we're, we're out of the city, of course, but she said, um, I purchased this property for $100,000 US two years ago, but she said 15 years ago, it was just over a million dollars. So property, I said, is that the norm? Is that a unique case? She said, there are 8 million properties in Japan at the moment that are vacant. So everyone's moved away from these wonderful properties, moved into the city where she said that you can purchase, say, an apartment for $45,000, $50,000 US. And you don't have to far to travel to go to work and stuff like that. But she said, real estate price just absolutely tumbled. Now, so when you start talking about property values falling in Australia, I mean, this is fairly typical. I mean, this is something that we can expect, and, and, and you've made reference to this anyway. This is a global issue. But does that surprise you, the information that I've just can uh, just shared with you about Japan? Not, not really. So if you
So look at Japan. I mean, Japan had one of the biggest bubbles in the history of the world in the late 80s. I mean, if you looked at the value of land and real estate in, in downtown Tokyo, it was worth more than all of the real estate in the United States um, uh, in terms of in terms of from the West Coast to the East Coast. So so the bubble is so big in Japan that that, that obviously house prices were, were, were going to fall. And, and, and the big uh, policy issue in Japan was that they didn't allow the free market to work. So, so yes, you've had deflation. Yes, um, the bubble is not as big as what it was in the late 80s, but uh, the government intervened massively to stop the market from correcting appropriately. And, and, and obviously this is why you've had basically very low growth for a long time because, uh, because it's still going through the deflationary process. And how they stopped the deflationary process, they've obviously been spending records amount of, uh, central um, government money, um, and, and it's been fun, funded by uh, you know irresponsible um, amounts of quantitative easing, and, and, and basically all of that money printing has been then concentrated in the Japanese bond market, which is above two hundred fifty percent of global GD, uh, so of, of Japanese GDP. Yeah. So, so 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 you know I mean there's a number of people who when we you know get to the gold and silver conversation say well. Uh, money printing, you know, um, doesn't lead to hyperinflation because it hasn't happened in Japan. Well, all of that, all of the money printing has been concentrated in in government bonds. Um, and, and and what separates, you know, Japan from say uh, Argentina, um, you know, so it, it's two factors. One is about the, you know, uh, who owns that debt, and a lot of Japanese debt is owned domestically, whereas Argentina's debt, uh, they borrowed significant amounts from the US, uh, from US banks in US dollars. But the other sort of issue is in terms of confidence. So confidence is still, uh, even though Japan is technically uh, very unsound, confidence still remains in the Japanese economy and in the, and in the Japanese yen, whereas confidence in, uh, in terms of uh, the Argentinian economy has basically fallen quite a bit. Okay, I, we keep on hearing or rep, referencing to debt. I was at a, at a conference going back about a year ago and I saw a young lady raise her hand and suggest to the speaker at the time, who was a gentleman by the name of Vern Gowdy, very qualified speaker. She said, Vern, do you think it just might, and she was a very young lady, she said, do you think it might just be that we, we have learnt to handle debt more effectively? Uh, he said, Madam, there is only one way that I've ever known that anyone or anybody or any country can go broke, and that's just to have too much debt. Um, it will, or that will never change. So looking at Australia's position now, you mentioned household debt before. How bad is the Australia? Where does it rate globally right now, household debt? How bad is it? Well, so in the context of Australian history, we've never had a debt bubble this big. So uh, in 2007, the Reserve Bank went on the record and said that in 2007, the, the level of debt and credit in the Australian economy was, uh, was more than the 1880s and the 1920s. And the reason why these two periods were significant was we had a depression in 1992 and we had a depression in 1931. So, uh, so, so where, you know, in, in the 11 years since 2007, household debt has, has, got, has grown you know, quite substantially compared to where we were 11 years ago. So, so, the, so we are completely, as a country, in unprecedented waters um, and there is no domestic historical precedent for it. Um, so where, where we are internationally, so uh, with the GFC, a number of economies around the world went through some sort of crisis and they got and, and their debt position basically got reset. So you look at the US, you look at Ireland, you look at Iceland, um, you know, and obviously there are a few different economies in Europe where they were able to sort of rectify the, the level of debt in the economy. Uh, we basically largely went unscathed because of a whole host of factors. Uh, I mean, the, we got a lifeline from the US Federal Reserve for a couple of our big banks. Uh, the, the Chinese had the biggest stimulus package in the world. Uh, we had a domestic stimulus package. Uh, we had uh, domestic interest rates gone from 7.4% to 3%. Uh, and, and we had work choices, which was the labor uh, industrial relations law at the time during the GFC. And I, in my view, that played a significant role in 
uh, giving businesses flexibility to sort of keep their doors open and keep people in jobs. So, so, so we never had the, the sort of um, the moment where we needed to face our demons in terms of the level of debt uh, and house prices in 2007. And, and basically we are, um, uh, we, we're at an uncharted place. So, so, so yeah, so obviously there's a, a few other economies around the world where um, household debt is a very significant issue. Um, so, 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 you know, Canada's about 170% uh, in terms of uh, household debt to disposable income. We're about 190.1 and, and, and the uh, June number will come out uh, next week. So we'll see what the Reserve Bank says. But so I expect that number to even go higher. Uh, there's a couple of uh, economies, I think, in Northern Europe, which may be uh, higher than we are, where we are today. But, uh, but, but, yeah, but we are one of the uh, leading countries in the world in terms of you know, our debt to income position. So it would appear as though we, um, we are extremely vulnerable at the moment. I mean, you've said household debt, huge, mortgage debt, huge. Let's look at household savings for a moment because I don't think we look really good in that department either, do we? No. So, so basically we have the lowest amount of household saving since the GFC. So uh, during the noughties, uh, I mean, the level, we actually had negative savings in Australia. So, no, but, so on, a, on a holistic basis, no one was saving uh, and basically everyone was getting into debt. Then when the GFC came uh, along, everyone got spooked and, and the household savings ratio went up to about 10%. Um, and basically since uh, that uh, sort of occurrence in about 2008, 2009, uh, we've seen a steady erosion of the household savings ratio. And a couple of weeks ago, the Australian Bureau of Statistics put out their latest uh, set of uh, uh, statistics on the national accounts for the June quarter. And we basically now have the lowest rate of household saving compared to December of 2007. So what we're seeing is, is that uh, people are spending way more than what their incomes are. Um, uh, and obviously some of this is in terms of discretionary, uh, uh, well, yes, some, some of it is in terms of discretionary spending. So things that people don't have to spend on, but are choosing to spend on. And then obviously it, some of it's non-discretionary. And obviously we're seeing uh, whether it is uh, transport, whether it is cost of living or rent or a few other factors, um, uh, you know, that, those non-discretionary uh, costs are, are obviously biting people's sort of um, household budgets. Um, uh, and obviously those factors are playing a role into why we see the household, household savings ratio, you know, you know where, where it is today. Well, look, um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with a gentleman by the name of, and I've had many conversations with Peter Daniels Sr., but he's been my lifetime mentor, very smart gentleman. But he used to say, Daryl, it really doesn't matter what happens tonight, anywhere in the world. Uh, I'll be able to wake up tomorrow morning and I'll still be able to party. He can say that because he has reserves. And so what you're really saying is that the average Australian citizen, family, have really very little in reserve. Uh, and so when we start talking about uh, economic Armageddon, and I know that's your favourite subject, I mean, we are poorly placed to accommodate an experience like that, aren't we? Yeah, yes. So, 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 a couple of points to make there. So, the first one is is that we had a, a, a prominent US economist last week, Martin Philstein, who came out and basically said that top policymakers around the world have no strategy to deal with the crisis uh, that's about to come, and that when, when, in his words, when the next recession comes, it could rival the Great Depression. So, so, so basically, it was a mission by top US economists to say that uh, the world's in trouble, we're going to have some sort of extreme economic event, and no one has a clue of how to actually deal with it. And it's interesting. So Ray Dalio uh, published a, a book last week uh, for free, gave an interview on CNBC, and basically said that in order to deal with the crisis, we need a third tool. And he didn't actually specify what the tool is, but he said we've got interest rate policy, we've got quantitative easing, and we need some third tool to keep the keep the party together. Um, and, and, and you know, what is that third tool? Is it uh, is it bail-ins? Is it 
universal basic income? Is it helicopter money? Um, you know, uh, he didn't really specify what that is. But, but I would say that Australia is one of the worst countries positioned economically to deal with these challenges because our parliamentarians are largely asleep. They don't understand these issues. Uh, our regulators have completely failed us. I mean, we've got um, record low interest rates. Uh, the Reserve Bank has basically said they're not going to raise interest rates between now and uh, 2021. Uh, obviously, APRA has been caught asleep at the wheel via the Royal Commission, and, and we're not having a proper uh, robust conversation in the media. And obviously, if your local paper is, is two months ago saying property is fantastic and now saying uh, you better watch out before you lose everything, well, we're not having an honest media and an honest national conversation either. Okay. Wow. We, oh, just for the moment, we'll move on to the next question because we have uh, a couple more for you. And I know that you've got, uh, you're going to provide us with some answers shortly on how we may prepare for some difficult times that, that may be looming ahead. How about we, Brian's got a really important question here. I know that he, he's been, he's just been pushing, jabbing me in the side here for the moment. Brian, your turn. Absolutely, absolutely, Doug. Um, yeah, John, in fact, uh, Daryl and yourselves have been going on for so long, I think you've covered my first question, but we'll, uh, we'll cover a few aspects of it. I, I listen to it a lot. Uh, one of my uh, uh, reporters, Egon von Grass, he, he just came out with a report with countries with falling currencies and then the rising gold price since January 2018. So we're talking from January for this year. I'm going to mention three countries that he's brought up out of the six. And uh, it's quite obviously from the countries that they're in deep straits. And I want that my question will follow suit. He states that the drop in currency in Venezuela this year is 99.9%. But the price of gold states that it has an increase of 2.3 million percent. Then he, he talks about Argentina with a drop in currency of 50%. Price in gold increase of 100%. And Turkey, 42% drop in currency and a 56% increase in gold. Now, could we see this happen in Australia with our massive deficit spending and debt to GDP out of control? Yes, yes. So, 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 so the first point to make is, is that, you know, when you see uh, hyperinflation as in Venezuela or when you see currencies collapsing to the scale that you're seeing in Argentina and Turkey, uh, you know, you're getting effectively a verdict from the market to say that we don't have confidence that you're managing your economy soundly, but also we don't think you can pay your debts. So, 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 so obviously, uh, you know, in 1985-86, uh, Australia had a balance of payments crisis, um, and we saw a reasonably significant fall over the 85-86 period of the Australian dollar versus, say, the US dollar. And obviously, this is where, in May of 1986, uh, Paul Keating gave the famous uh, uh, interview with John Laws and said, we're headed towards a banana republic if we don't actually um, come to face our challenges. And then in August of 1986, um, uh, he had a significant uh, budget where he, um, where, where he cut spending and he sold some assets and raised some taxes uh, in order to um, close the, um, in terms of the deficit that was happening uh, with his, uh, under his, uh, sort of under the Hawke government. So, so, so it is absolutely possible that with the amount of uh, household debt, but you know, and we haven't really touched on it in terms of this interview, but I think we spoke about it when we last spoke uh, when I was in Adelaide about in terms of the foreign debt. So the foreign debt is at a record high now. Uh, it's, it's, it's above a trillion dollars. It's, it's 1.036 trillion. Um, it's about 58% of, of GDP. Um, you know, the IMF has said that once foreign debt gets about 50% of GDP, then, then it can become, you know, th there's a big chance that, um, that the risks of being able to service that debt will, will obviously increase. And, you know, when you look at our gross foreign debt, which is about $2.2 trillion, 486 billion of that 2.2 trillion of gross foreign debt um, is, is 90 day debt. So, 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 so in every 90 days, we've got to turn over nearly uh, half a trillion dollars um, in terms of debt. Um, and, and, and obviously, if there is any shake uh, of confidence in Q3 
key markets uh, who are funding, who are providing this funding to us, uh, we, we, we could easily see our banks get in trouble, uh, the currency get in trouble, um, and obviously if we saw the currency get in trouble, uh, you know, gold or silver relative to, uh, you know, uh, relative to the Australian dollar could move very rapidly, just like we've seen in Turkey, Argentina and Venezuela. Yeah, I hadn't realised those figures that uh, what Australia's debt, what we have to pay back uh, in such a short term notice as well. All right, look, we're going to move from the debt levels of Australia, which is an important issue, but uh, some other interesting articles that I've read just recently. JP Morgan, according to Ted Butler, has 750 to 800 million ounces of physical silver stored in their warehouses. What advantages would this give to JP Morgan in the next six to 18 months? Sure. So, 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 so yeah, so um, the first point to make about the Ted Butler analysis is, is that, you know, uh, you know, in some quarters, Ted is respected, uh, but then obviously the, there are other people who have a different point of view. And obviously, I think in one of your previous interviews, you've interviewed David Morgan. So, so I think the first point, to, I think the first point to make is, is that there is um, a lack of transparency uh, in, in the gold and silver market. And obviously, because of this lack of transparency, particularly with the commitment of traders report uh, certain people come to different views uh, but but you, you, you know I mean, you see a, a wide range of, of views and opinion so 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 I guess you know uh, you know David Morgan says that the amount is um, 140 million ounces Ted Butler says it's about 750 million ounces uh, and then David Morgan says some of it may not be all of the JP Morgan's money but it may be client money so but, but what we know is that even if you take the conservative view that David Morgan has expressed uh, JP Morgan probably has one of the largest silver positions in, 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 in the world in terms of its physical holdings. So, so, so why would they be doing that? Uh, I mean, you're seeing a behavior, not only in terms of bullion banks on Wall Street, but you're seeing the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, the Turkish, uh, some, some countries in Europe where they are amassing a massive amount of gold and silver. Um, and obviously two weeks ago, uh, you saw the German finance minister starting to exp you know, express a lack of confidence in the American dollar and the American banking system and, and basically saying we need a new global monetary system because uh, you know, uh, you know, we, were on the, 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 we were on the US dollar system since you know, basically since 1944 with the Brennan Woods system, which was backed by gold. Uh, the, you know, uh, the, the, the Nixon administration was running out of gold because they were running massive deficits during Vietnam. Uh, and they had to, and, and, and people rather than getting pieces of paper out of the US, they wanted gold for that. So obviously, this is where Charles de Gaulle basically demanded that the French get their gold out of, out of New York, uh, and then he sent sort of military ships to New York to get his gold. And and, and so because they were you know, draining their gold reserves, that's why they shut the window, the gold um, window in uh, 1971. And so since then. Uh, we, we've basically had um, a, a fair currency system. Uh, and, and the way the Americans have been able to uh, ensure that the American dollar has remained uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, stable in use, uh, uh, but also kept its value is through the petrodollar system. So, 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 so this has allowed the Americans have, to, you, know, you know, this has allowed, have allowed the Americans to blow up the, their monetary supply since the early 70s. Uh, and obviously we've got, you know, uh, because of that, the biggest sort of debt bubble in the history of the world. So, so I think there's a lot of people, whether it's, uh, you know, JP Morgan or, you know, even, uh, even Von Greyer and a whole bunch of other people saying that uh, uh, the, the amount of debt and the amount of money that's being printed in, in the global system is unsustainable. And, and, and obviously, uh, that debt bubble is going to come to a head. And, and basically, those who hold physical gold or silver will be uh, holding real wealth. Uh, and, and basically, you know, that in this environment, but it's also true for the last 5,000 years, it is the best way to protect your wealth, um, particularly when you have um, significant economic upheaval. Yeah, very interesting, because I know the, uh, it, there's been talk about a new world uh, reserve currency, and I know China doesn't want it, um, and everybody's avoiding, every government seems to be avoiding gold as a reserve currency, but when you think about it, gold cannot be valued in, in American dollar terms. It's got to be valued on what it will, what it will buy when the chips are down. Sure. So 
My last question before Daryl um, begins again. What, as a company, we are bullion dealers here in Australia, um, and we're seeing a wholesale shortage of silver bullion. What I mean by that is, if we want to place an order for American silver eagles at the moment, which is a one ounce coin, right, we can't get them, right? The United States Mint uh, one month ago said to its distributors that they've run out of 2018 coins and they do not know when they'll be back, hopefully this year. But it wouldn't surprise me if they were out for the rest of the year and were now starting to mint the 2019 ones. Obviously, they can't get the silver, they can't get the silver out of the ground quick enough. Um, we're, we're seeing a, we get a, a big supply of Sunshine Mint Industry one ounce coins. They've even said to us up to a month ago, up to a week ago, we had a delivery from them uh, six weeks, six weeks delivery, but they've just written to us to say, hold the orders. We're, we're running out of silver. Now, what is interesting is that the gold to silver ratio, which you can have a look on any screen is 84 to one. So 84 ounces of silver will buy one ounce of gold, but they're only digging silver out at nine to one ratio. So where, where do you think this is going? Where do you think it's going to head? So, so, so there's probably a, like a, a couple of points to make about that. So the first thing that I think your viewers and, and your existing or potentially new customers who, who are looking to buy gold and silver is when you look at the gold or silver international spot price, that price does not reflect the physical market. That price reflects the uh, future derivatives market. Um, and it's, it's basically a paper price. And there's a whole host of um, 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 commentators who have basically said the amount of gold and silver traded on the COMEX or the LVMA is way above what the physical amount of gold or silver that those exchanges hold. Uh, but, but also in terms of what the uh, people who have the uh, sort of short positions say that they can actually deliver uh, in, in terms of those contracts. So, so, so obviously there's been a range of plays that have said that um, that, you know, well, I mean, I mean, if gold or silver is, is to spy, it's going to happen for one of two reasons. One, it, it is because of the economic situation, which we've sort of talked about in this interview. But the other uh, way gold or silver, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the international price could, could spike significantly is, is that if there is um, a break between, uh, you know, the, the dimensions of, of the physical market and the dimensions of the paper market. So basically, uh, you know, when you look at the international spot price, you think that, uh, that that's gold or silver, you know, uh, particularly in American dollars, that, that it is pretty low. Uh, and obviously, if it's low, that means that demand is low. But but if in reality, the physical market um, is, is, you know, you're seeing a record amount of demand for physical gold and silver. Um, well, you know, if we're getting to the point where people are saying, well, we can't deliver gold and silver, I think that's going to uh, ultimately um, result in people losing confidence in the physical, sorry, sorry, in the paper market exchanges. Uh, and, and obviously that's how you potentially could see, a, you know, in terms of a break of, of, of the COMEX and the LBMA. So, so if that were to happen, uh, you know, there's been a very ex extravagant and exotic forecast as to what would happen if the physical market met the paper market. Uh, you know, some people saying uh, an ounce of silver and US dollars could go as high as six, to $800, uh, you know, uh, some people saying that, you know, at least it would go up to about $100 US, whereas now it is uh, about $14. So, so, so we'll obviously have to see where it is, but you know, on the gold to silver ratio, I mean, you mentioned 84, a couple of days ago for a brief amount of time, it hit 85, which was the highest in 27 years. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm happy to sort of, you know, tell your viewers that, you know, I, uh, I really don't own any gold at the moment. I've, I own, you know, quite a bit of silver, uh, and obviously silver, you know, relative to gold is dirt cheap at the moment. And, and if you are looking to preserve your wealth, uh, particularly in as, as we head towards a, a, a catastrophic economic event, uh, silver is is dead cheap compared to gold. Interesting. Thanks very much for that, John. We're going to say it's really what I find really interesting about all of this, John, is that we've we've seen the the mints uh, indicate and advise us that well, they can't supply. This is with a surge in interest over a period of a couple of months with silver prices being very low. Can you imagine what would happen if, if all of a sudden, the, uh, instead of 1% of the population, the global population, which is about what it is, being interested in precious metals, it went to 1.5, or 
all of a sudden started to say, okay, we need to buy some. We need to protect our wealth. If that happened, the you would find the unavailable, uh, unavailability of precious metals would, would just, through supply and demand, force the price of precious metals through the roof. Uh, I don't think we're very far away from seeing this happen. I must admit I'm astounded that major mints around the world ha have been confronted with this problem. Um, just, and they cannot give us a date. They've said, we cannot give you a date at this point of time when we will open again for sales. So I think we're on. I think we're on the cliff edge. I really do. So, so yeah. So you know, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, the, the the really interesting thing about that is, is that obviously when I talk to um, you know a, a whole host of people about um, the economy um, and, and getting ready um, and obviously holding good money that can preserve your wealth. Uh, I mean, I mean, you you have some people say, uh, yeah, things like this. So I understand the argument. You know, look, it all makes sense. But I've got these uh, things that I need to take care of now, uh, and once I've get, you know taken care of um, you know certain bills or whatever the case may be, then I'll go into it. Well, I mean, clearly what you're expressing is is that um, you know the physical market is getting very tight now, um, and, and when certain people want to get in, um, you know the the gold sort of may not be there. So it's so obviously uh, you know while it's available, uh, you you obviously got to sort of you got to jump in and try to get what you can get. But, uh, but, 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 but you know, obviously what you're saying now is that even now, uh, you, know, for, you know, I mean, depending on what product you want, uh, certain people may not be able to get any. Absolutely. They won't be able to get any. That's the point. I mean, we have so many people that have said to me, and I know Jim Rickards makes reference to this as well. Hey, just tell me where the day before this, you know, silver and gold are about to launch and I'll just come in and buy a stack. Well, the point is you won't be able to buy any. That's really the problem. And we've already seen an illustration of that now. So uh, as I said, I think we're really close to seeing uh, silver and precious metals just fire up. John, based on what we've discussed, there seems a genuine need for concern. I know you refer to a 10-step plan to prepare for this looming crisis. You call it economic Armageddon. Yeah. Could you please discuss these 10 points with our viewers, starting with point one, uh, and sure. you've made reference to reading history, which I think is a, an extremely valid point. Sure. So, so yeah, so, I, I mean, I mean uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if your viewers are interested, I, I did, I mean, just for this sake, I did publish an article back in June on news.com you know, in terms of the 10 steps of how to prepare for economic Armageddon. So, so, yeah, so obviously in terms of reading history, the reason why I put that in terms of the first point is, is that um, uh, the current crop of Australians haven't gone through genuine tough economic times. So you think to particularly the cohort under about 44, 45 years old. So you go back to the last recession, which was 1991, uh, and you go back 18 years. And basically, if you think about it, people born after 1973 have not gone through genuine economic time, uh, a genuine economic hardship in terms of being a working adult. Uh, and then, obviously, if you're above 45 years old, well, uh, you know, I mean, look, for a lot of people, they haven't really gone through, you know, something horrific um, because the last, you know, really genuine horrific thing that we're talking about is 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 what happened in the Great Depression. So, so, so given where the debt levels are, you know, both domestically and internationally, um, you know, the 1991 recession isn't really a good reference point because it's going to be so much more worse than what happened in 91. So, so because people don't have any genuine real world experience of, of what we're talking about the best way to understand how people go through tough economic times how to prepare and what may happen with asset prices and, and investment portfolios uh you know the best you, your only guide is to go and read history and to understand what has happened in the past and and, and see whether those lessons are applicable um going forward point two so yeah, so point two, um, basically focusing on personal cash flow. So obviously we're seeing at the moment household balance sheets are getting stretched, um, and, 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 and you know, you know, as, as we said previously, people are not saving sufficient amounts of money. So so obviously to get your household in in in, in better shape, uh, focus on your cash flow. Uh, find areas where you can cut spending. Find areas where you can generate more income. Find ways that you can put money aside. 
Um, uh, and, and obviously, if you can do that, you'll be uh, in a better position to handle tougher economic times. Mm. Point three, John. The point three is, um, so, so, so that's all about reducing debt. And obviously this whole conversation has been about largely reducing debt. So to, to, the, uh, to the extent that people can reduce their debts, um, they obviously should. Uh, in terms of step four, so step four is about holding good money. So uh, basically what I, what I was sort of making the point is, is that depending on the scenario that, 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 that comes forward, and, and, you know, and there was an article I wrote for news.com about the six pathways to Armageddon, and I, and I basically described six potential scenarios of how this may play out. Uh, depending on how that plays out and depending on how the parliament uh, and the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia sort of respond to that crisis, uh, that could have significant implications for the purchasing power of the Australian dollar. So, so if you do have savings, you have to think about, well, what's the best form of savings that's going to uh, retain its value and retain its purchasing power, whether it's, whether it's the Australian dollar, whether it's cryptocurrencies or whether it is gold and silver. And, and obviously, I've taken the view that gold and silver, because of 5,000 years of, of history, is, is probably going to be the best way to preserve uh, people's wealth. How to argue with that, isn't it? It's over a very long period of time, <laughs> stood the test of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and I have to say, I think that's really interesting that you've used that uh, phrase because a lot of people have faith in cryptocurrencies, but they really have not been tested sure. in, when, sure. when, a, when a big crisis happens. And we don't know exactly what Bitcoin's got, how it's going to perform, uh, you know, when, when, when a genuine sort of crash does come. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Next point. Uh, so, so step five is, is all about diversifying income and in terms of skill set. So, so obviously for most people, they rely on their job uh, in terms of their main income source. Um, and, and basically what I'm saying is, is that if you have a couple of different ways of how to make money, um, and, um, and obviously if you've got you know, a whole bunch of different skill sets, then, then obviously you have um, more flexibility uh, and you have more agility to uh, position yourself if, if your main source of income were to evaporate. So for example, you may have a business on the side, you may have, um, you know, you may have a, a job part-time after hours. So, so obviously if you lost your main job, but you have a couple of other income sources, well that will allow you to sort of continue getting money in the door to pay your bills rather than having to, you know, look at bankruptcy if you've lost your main source of income. So, so that's, that's uh, uh, step five. Step six is all about improving home skills. So I think for the current uh, crop of Australians, uh, most people have, have, have lost the art of how to run a, run a household. And obviously, you know, we, we pay for so much, whereas, uh, you know, maybe you guys or your parents' generation all ordered it in home, whether it's around uh, in terms of fixing your car, in terms of making your own food, making your own clothes. So, so to the extent that you have those... Um, that you have those home schools and you can sort of save on money by doing some of these things yourself. Uh, I mean, that will help people um, get through tough economic times. So that's step six. Step seven is you know, strengthening personal relationships. So, so I think when you have genuine adversity, uh, you know, no matter whether it's about economic or, or, or whether it's in another context, uh, if you have a strong supportive network of friends and family that, you help them, they help you. I think that is, is, is you know, quite important uh, in terms of um, getting, getting through uh, you know, tough economic times. And obviously, you know, in terms of this list, I mean, uh, what I said to New Slimman when I put this list together was I didn't want to necessarily just do a straight sort of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of a financial economic sort of uh, preparation list, because I think uh, the social cost of what we're talking about is going to be quite huge. And I think the social cost is something that, most Australians don't realise that when you go through a genuine economic time, uh, you know, suicide goes up, divorce goes up, um, alcoholism, yeah. family breakdown, etc. So, so yeah, so so I think people need to be thinking about not just how do they um, stay economically afloat, but how do they keep their families together and how do they keep their sort of mental, uh, physical, and emotional well-being in place. So, so that's the purpose of the list. So obviously, having having a close network of friends and family that you can help and they can help you. I think it's quite important. Uh, obviously, step uh, eight is all about eating healthy um, and, and, and being physically fit. So, so obviously, uh, you know, I think that's quite important in terms of um, physical and, and mental health, but also, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, protecting yourself, you know, in terms of uh, 
things like in terms of depression, uh, but also um, ha having greater resilience. Uh, step nine is all about embracing spirituality. Uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, uh, I tend to be you know, somewhat religious myself, but I think people who, who believe in, in a higher power um, can, can draw inspiration, um, you know, particularly in adverse economic times. And I think some form of spirituality, whatever that um, religion may be, you know, I, I think that can give comfort to people when, when times are tough. Uh, and then obviously in terms of step 10, it is all about being politically aware, getting engaged in the public policy debate, uh, and obviously uh, not, not basically relying on the governments of the day or, or regulators to, um, to set the course of the country. I think everyone has to assume responsibility for their own country and obviously play their own part in engaging in, in the big political debates of the time uh, so that we can actually advocate for good policy um, so that the country um, sort of doesn't get into the situation again, but we can uh, you know, handle this coming storm uh, the best way we can. Well, yeah, some good advice there and a lot to think about. Brian, have you got anything you would like to throw at John um, as we as we close today? Anything that you think he may have left out? That, well, uh, no, I don't think you left out anything, John. Uh, <laughs> covering all those points, uh, the 10 points there is, uh, is something to really think about. No, I think we can uh, just about finish. Uh, finish off. Here. Well, you know, I, I could talk to John all day. In fact, I get an opportunity to do that quite often. But uh, John, it's just terrific for you to be able to share this information with our viewers today. It's, uh, it's just been fantastic. And we really appreciate the time and the effort that you put in to provide us with this information. At this point, John, I'd like to thank you so very much for your contribution today. The information at times could have been considered maybe a little bit depressing, but as always, not for those who are prepared. And you have certainly outlined a plan to achieve that. History continues to remind us that some of the greatest fortunes that have ever been made have been made during the toughest and most testing economic times. John, of course, will be our main keynote speaker in just over two weeks' time. This is Saturday, October 6th at the Highway Hotel on the corner of Marion and Road, Marion Road and Anzac Highway in Adelaide, of course, the premier city. It will be at 12 for a 12.30 registration for a 1 p.m. start, concluding at 5 p.m. We still have some seats left. If you would like to register for the event, uh, we, will play, uh, if, yeah, we will place the link in the video description below. John, once again, thank you, mate. Um, and we look forward to a most absorbing afternoon come October 6th. And that may I remind you to all stay educated and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, sir.